Hello, and thank you for attending today's STEM in 30 webinar on the fundamentals of making and tinkering in education. This will be recorded and archived on the OC STEM website. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box, and we will do our best to address them during the webinar. There will also be a few minutes at the end reserved for questions. Today's presenters are myself, Rachel Andres, and my colleague, Elizabeth Mercado. Elizabeth and I are AmeriCorps VISTA members for the Maker Education Initiative. Hello. For those of you who are unfamiliar with AmeriCorps, it's a national community service program supported by the federal government, and the goal is to help meet critical needs in the community. AmeriCorps partners with nonprofits and public agencies to fulfill assignments in fields like education, public safety, healthcare, and environmental protection. It's often compared to the Peace Corps as its domestic version. VISTA, which stands for Volunteers in Service to America, is a branch of AmeriCorps whose main focus is to build the capacity of the organizations they serve by fundraising, recruitment, and outreach. One of AmeriCorps VISTA's partners is Maker Education a nonprofit that was created in 2012 in response to President Obama's Educate to Innovate campaign. So our mission as Maker Vistas is to create more opportunities for youth to develop confidence, creativity, and an interest in learning, especially within the STEM subjects. We believe that this will be made possible through making and tinkering opportunities in education, which is what inspired us to offer this two-part webinar. And we wanted to offer some information about this very unique approach to education. So whether you're a teacher, an after-school provider, a parent, or someone who is interested in STEM education, uh, we wanted to provide you with some tips, some strategies, and resources regarding making and tinkering in both formal and informal learning environments. So today um, we will discuss the value of making and tinkering and the benefits of incorporating these strategies into the classroom. Uh, we will also explain how to set the stage for implementation by one, uh, creating an environment that is conducive to making and tinkering, and two, by choosing the proper materials and supplies. At the end of our presentation, uh, we will share a few resources that we thought could help you to get started right away. Immediately following part one, we are going to be hosting part two, where we will discuss four strategies for facilitating making and tinkering activities. We will also offer some additional resources to help you along the way. Again, both of these webinars will be housed on the OC STEM website, so you'll be able to access them at your convenience. So let's get started. Um, we all know the meaning of the words making and tinkering. Making is the process of producing something, and tinkering is the process of uh, repairing or improving something, um, or just taking it apart in a very casual way. Um, what you may not know is that it's actually being regarded as a learning approach, uh, much like the, the Montessori approach, which is characterized by an emphasis on independence, freedom within limits, and respect for a child's natural psychological, physical, and social development. Making and tinkering can also be thought of as playful investigation. It's a way for students to engage in hands-on and open-ended activities, and that allows them to explore possible answers to their own questions. Using play with the intention of teaching and learning offers a self-driven learning opportunity, and it is by nature personal and interesting. When students are interested in what they're learning, they become invested in the outcomes, and the result is increased engagement. By becoming engaged in the process of exploration and discovery, students have the opportunity to develop important life skills, like confidence, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking, which I like to refer to as the four C's. Making and tinkering um, can also build students' confidence by providing them an opportunity to learn through trial and error. So by trying and failing and trying again, students will learn by doing, and by doing, students will follow their unique thought processes to come up with an attainable solution. So students and teachers alike can benefit from the realization that there isn't always one right answer. Uh, sometimes there are many correct answers, and sometimes there are no answers at all. 
only theories and ideas. These theories and ideas can be considered as possible solutions through the process of elimination, which is important for kids to experience in order to help them develop the analytical skills to determine which information is useful to their cause. Trial and error is a hugely important notion in making and tinkering. Think of Thomas Edison and the light bulb. When he was asked why he continued to test his light bulb idea after it had failed thousands of times, Thomas Edison said, I did not fail 10,000 times. I learned the 10,000 ways in which not to do it. Through the process of trial and error, kids learn that nothing important works for the first time, as stated by Dr. Seymour Popper, who is an innovative educator, MIT mathematician, and computer scientist. In the 80s, Dr. Popper introduced his theories behind constructionist learning, where students construct mental models to understand the world around them. It is very much connected to experiential learning, where students use information they previously learned to acquire more knowledge. This approach is sometimes known as problem-based learning, which allows students to learn about a subject by offering them multiple problems so that they will then be able to construct their own understanding of the subject through these problems. Making and tinkering also promotes the development of creativity, which can be inspired in many ways. One of the easiest ways to stir up creativity among your students is by offering them a variety of materials that they haven't used before, like gears and wires, for example, or sticks and stones even. Um, by providing materials other than the normal paper, crayons, scissors, and glue, it gets kids thinking imaginatively about all the possibilities of using just random stuff. Instead of doing the regular holiday crafts like, you know, like making an evergreen tree out of paper and drawing on some cool decorations, you could have your kids tinker with LED lights and coin cell batteries and challenge them to get their paper tree to light up. Activities like this get kids to start thinking about how things work in conjunction with one another. So using unfamiliar materials can also prove to be a little teacher's trick. Uh, even if you don't have all of the materials needed for a specific activity, you can still substitute items that you have for the ones you do not have and still achieve a similar outcome or maybe an outcome you never even expected. Um, even if all you can get your hands on is paper, crayon, scissors, and glue. Challenge your students to use the familiar materials in unfamiliar ways. So instead of using those things to make a collage, can you use these same items to build a model? Collaboration is another important skill that students will develop through making and tinkering um, as a group. So this is easily initiated through group brainstorming, where all students are encouraged to share their ideas and receive feedback from their peers. Um, prototyping or modeling their ideas is another important step in making activities. And by collaborating during this step, um, the students will uh, be forced to think deep, deeply about their original ideas and the strengths and weaknesses behind their designs. Brainstorming and prototyping together provides a great opportunity for students to learn effective communication by presenting their ideas and sharing the reasoning behind them. Uh, it's also a good confidence building strategy as students have an open floor in which to say whatever is on their mind without having to worry about negative criticism. Uh, of course, ground rules need to be established around this type of open sharing. Uh, some crucial rules, for example, are be respectful, do not interrupt, explain the what, the why, and how of your idea. Uh, some important reminders uh, to students should include no idea is ever a bad idea, and all ideas can combine into one bigger and better idea after all. Um, and so with collaboration, you'll simultaneously be promoting confidence and non-judgment social skills. The last of the four C's is critical thinking and that can be established through inquiry-based learning which is another key idea in making and tinkering. Inquiry means to seek information by questioning. 
So inquiry-based learning is driven from students' personal questions. For example, say we have a student called Rose, and Rose wants to know how to make her toy car move on its own. She thinks she could get this to happen by using a motor, so she will need to learn how to work this motor. She'll need to learn how to turn it on and how to attach it to the toy car to make it go. So through this whole process, Rose will learn basic knowledge about electricity. She'll understand that a motor requires a power source, like a battery, in order to function, and that the movement relies on both positive and negative electrical currents. But effective inquiry is more than just asking questions. It's actually a pretty complex process that we all use every day to convert regular information into useful knowledge. And it's through this process that we have a chance to develop an understanding of the world in which we live, learn, work, and communicate. And it's not so much about finding the right answer, because often there is none. Uh, it's more about coming up with resolutions to life's everyday questions and issues. I definitely agree with that. Um, inquiry provides us with different ways of viewing the world and coping with the questions that come about on a regular daily basis. Confucius, who was a great philosopher of his time, explained the essence of inquiry-based learning in the quote here, which is, tell me and I will forget, show me and I may remember, but involve me and I will understand. So let's talk about how to set the stage for making and tinkering in your classroom or out of your out-of-school time space. Uh, just like any workspace, the environment needs to be conducive to the work you are doing. Um, making and tinkering requires lots of open floor space. Um, not only will this allow your students to work with lots of materials all at once, but it will allow them to move easily through the room to see what others are doing, um, thus helping to foster collaboration among one another. It's also a good idea to provide lots of different types of resources and reference material, materials uh, to spark their creativity. Uh, so try having a combination of encyclopedias, picture books, magazines, models, and other educational toys. Be sure that these resources are made easily accessible so students know they can use them at will. Um, another important aspect of creating a making and tinkering environment is keeping lots of student works on display. This shows students that you value their work and can also be an additional reference for other projects and ideas, and it will also foster their confidence as well. So here are a few things you might consider trying out right away. So try replacing desks with tables, and if desks are all you have, try arranging them in groups instead of lines. You might even try pushing all the tables or desks to the perimeter of the room, leaving a lot of open space in the middle. Uh, a less formal classroom setup can make students feel more at ease to make, a, to make and tinker um, because making and tinkering are quite informal approaches to learning. So I just wanted to mention a really cool idea that we had gotten from somebody who works at the Discovery Cube, which was formerly called the Discovery Science Center. Uh, his name was Paul Pooler, and he shared his idea for an epic fail wall which I thought was a really creative way to display student works. Because by displaying all kinds of works, even the type of work that we might consider as failures, embraces both successes and failures as accomplishments. And like we mentioned earlier, the best way to learn something is to find out all the ways that it didn't work. So um, just a bit ago, I had shared with you that an easy way to promote creativity is by offering a wide variety of materials. And you might be wondering what types of materials would be suitable for a making and tinkering activity. So an important thing to consider in material choice would be to choose items that are both gender and age neutral. Um, I think that this encourages kids to use anything and everything that's available without judgment. So instead of pinks and blues, try reds and yellows. And in place of dolls and trucks, you could try to offer blocks and building materials. Um, try to also choose materials that kids don't often get a chance to use. I like to offer innards of old computers or broken appliances 
because there's just something about the cords, wires, and electrical components that's really fascinating to kids. It might be because they're always being told not to touch them. Um, but if you can combine these unfamiliar materials with stuff that they use all the time, um, it can create a really unique experience. So one making and tinkering activity I've used combines batteries and motors with plastic cups, markers, and erasers to create a unique robot that makes art. Um, we call them scribble bots. And uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll provide a link to that activity so you can check it out for yourself. But maybe the most important thing to remember when it comes to choosing materials is that you don't need the newest, coolest, or fanciest supplies and equipment. Use whatever you can find, because can, kids might really amaze you with, what they, with the ways they come up with to use these different materials. Here are a few tips for material choice. Have recyclables available, especially plastic water bottles with caps. Those are a must, along with toilet paper rolls and tissue boxes. Cardboard is also a wonderful material. It's easy to work with and super versatile. And it can also be a great prototyping material, um, as opposed to maybe more expensive things that you've used like clay or poster board. Um, something to remember with cardboard is the larger the boxes, the better. So I've seen groups of kids construct a two-story fort using piles of cardboard, duct tape, and zip ties. And they were just so excited about this activity. They were occupied for hours just building all sorts of tubes and tunnels. And I've seen another cool use for cardboard. Uh, a nine-year-old boy uh, named Kane Monroy spent his summer vacation uh, one year building an elaborate cardboard arcade. I definitely recommend checking this out. Uh, just Google and type in Kane's Arcade and you'll find a lot of stuff about what he's built. It's even turned into something called the Global Cardboard Challenge. So check it out. It would be a great um, idea for your students to relate to someone who at their age did something really awesome using his making and tinkering skills. How cool. That sounds like so much fun. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one more tip for material choice is to never underestimate the dollar store. Um, they usually have a small toy or craft section where you will find lots of little treasures. Some cool things that I've seen there before were um, sticky back foam pieces and glitter glue. So um, one other great place to shop is Amazon. You can find just about anything under the sun for a reasonable price. And you can also try the Amazon Prime membership or purchase that membership. And that would allow you to get free shipping and handling and some other good deals. Um, another tip would be to remember to buy in bulk whenever it's feasible. Because big quantities often come with even bigger savings. So I'll just um, give you three good companies that offer good bulk options. You can jot them down if you're interested. The first is Oriental Trading Company. The second is American Science and Surplus. And the third is School Supply Giant. Um, I've, I've had a chance to look at all three of these sites and they offer a wide variety at really good prices. Um, most of them ship from within the United States and you can get free shipping if you order um, lots of stuff, say 50 to to $100 worth of stuff. But you don't always have to rely on stores for your supplies. Never forget to reach out to the community for support. If you need paint, for example, you could check your local hardware store and see if they have any unsellable paint cans. They might be willing to, no to donate them to you. Um, another good idea might be if you need wood to visit the Home Depot in your neighborhood and see if they have any leftover pallets that you could have. Um, for obtaining materials, you can also try deconstruction activities, which is a great way to obtain stuff. You can just have your students deconstruct broken toys, old appliances, use furniture, just anything you can get your hands on that they can take apart. Um, not only can you get some pretty valuable items, but it's a great opportunity for kids to see how things are put together and how they work. Uh, one more tip for obtaining materials is to ask parents. 
Any old or unused items could be potential supplies for making and tinkering. The sky's the limit, which is why a lot of these activities can be so exciting and educational. So as you've heard, a making and tinkering offer a unique learning experience that is thought-provoking and exciting for both students and adults. Um, it's all about being creative, thinking outside of the box, or imagining that there is no box, um, and allowing students to learn through exploration and discovery. So through this process, um, again, students will develop important life skills like competence, creativity, collaboration, and critical thinking. Um, all it takes is an open mind and the willingness to try new things. And that's the key driver, um, your willingness as an educator. If we expect our students to engage with us, um, we have to be willing to share the role of student teacher with them as well. I also just wanted to mention that making and tinkering in education is part of an even bigger picture. It's part of a social movement that many have started to call the maker movement. Um, some people consider it a contemporary subculture of do-it-yourselfers, but however you look at it, the maker movement stresses new and unique applications of technology, and it definitely encourages invention and prototyping. So the main focus for the maker movement is on learning practical skills and using them creatively. And I would, I would suggest that anybody can just type in the maker movement into Google and you, you'll see all the different programs that are happening. Um, you'll get information about maker fairs. Um, you can see a lot of photos, project ideas, all sorts of really cool stuff. So I definitely urge you to, to check out the maker movement. So we're nearing the end of this uh, STEM in 30 segment. So we'd like um, to take a, just a few minutes to answer any questions you may have. So please type your questions in the chat box. So the first question is, how can I relate this to my STEM program or STEM curriculum? Um, I think it can relate to any STEM program um, because not only does it go into um, STEM subject material, like that's related to science, technology, engineering, and math, but it also promotes um, the four C's that we discussed, which is confidence, collaboration, creativity, and um, critical thinking. And these are all really important things that come out of any STEM, STEM curriculum. So. Um, because they're open-ended, they're, they're easy to plug into any current curriculum that you might be using. Um, and oftentimes you can find activities that relate to what kids are already learning in the school day. And just to add a little bit to that, um, I think that STEM, or students are already practicing making and tinkering when they're doing STEM activities. So this is just um, this is just putting a name to what they're already actually doing, so that they're more aware of it as they're doing it. Um, and yeah, just to add to the to the STEM practices, um, making and tinkering um, just complement what what STEM activities is already doing. All right, so um, if, you, if you have any other questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and discuss some resources with you. Um, some of these resources will definitely be able to get you started right away with making and tinkering. Um, I suggest you visit the Maker Ed Resource Library, where you can find everything you need to know about making an education. There's information on program planning and management. Um, there's projects and activity guides, and there's just a lot of resources. So definitely check them out. Um, I also highly recommend the book called Invent to Learn. This book is by Sylvia Libo Martinez and Gary Steger, and you can buy it from Amazon for about $25. Otherwise, definitely check out your local library and see if they have a copy. 
And another good place to find activities is the Tinkering Studio, which is actually part of the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Uh, their website is here, and this is the same website where you'll be able to access that Scribblebot activity that I mentioned earlier, the one that involves um, motors and markers and cups. Um, if you go to their website, I think that they call it Scribbling Machines. So you'll just be able to type that in the search and, and it'll pop up. Uh, so thank you so much for attending today's webinar on the fundamentals of making and tinkering in education. But we hope you will walk away with some key strategies to implement in your classroom or your out of school time space um, or your home, wherever you are. Uh, if you have any other questions or would like more information, uh, feel free to contact us using our direct email addresses shown right here. Um, and stay tuned for part two on the Art of Facilitation, uh, which will be aired immediately following this webinar. And it will also be archived on the OC STEM website. And thanks again, and have a wonderful day.